All right. We are going to start in a half banana asana. Sounds kind of like a banana split. You come lying onto your back and you put your right ankle to the outside of your left knee. And then you let your legs drop to the left. Your right foot is on the floor. And then you stretch your arms over your head. You might even take your shoulders a little bit to the left if you have a lot of openness in your rib cage here. And you grab opposite elbows over the top of your head. If that's too much, you can have cactus arms. What you're gonna feel is a, a big extension kind of along your side body. So take a full inhale and with your exhale, just sigh it out. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> let's try that again. <clears throat> make whatever weird noises you have to make to get it out of the way, but then sigh it out. It should be a lovely sigh. <laughs> And in this first pose, especially, maybe take a couple moments with your eyes closed. Allow your breath to be experienced how it is to breathe in this shape. And take a couple of breaths and notice, which you probably already did when you breathed into the shape, but just notice how you are. Are there <clears throat> any dreams lurking at the edges of your awareness? How is your thinking? How is your heart? And how is your body? And to put, put our practice in context of the whole universe, both known and unknown, should I say the whole cosmos, we're going to allow Orlin's words to help us be there. Infinite stars, infinite space, source of the knowledge of the world, giver of thoughts that empower creation, transforming light into the elements of matter, radiate before my mind the seven keys that unlock the doors of the mystery temple that I may enter and fulfill the purpose for which my birth initiates. Take three more rich, full breaths. And after your third, find your way back to center. You might want to wiggle around. You might need to just lie still for a moment. 
We want to be able to be proactive to make this practice our own. And then find your way to both feet on the yoga mat with your knees bent. This time, take your right ankle to the outside of your left knee. That's just backwards. <laughs> you got it, though. Your left leg to the outside of your right knee. And then let both of your knees drop to the right. And you feel into your body. You might just shift your shoulders to the right as well. And so that will increase the stretch in the side ribs here. The intercostal muscles. Take a full breath in, feeling how the posture feels on this side. And with your exhale, sigh out your breath one more time. Today, our practice is focusing on the organ pair of the yin lungs and the yang large intestines. The occult connection of the lungs is to mercury. And the element is mineral in the traditional Chinese system. There are five elemental cosmology, the Taoist cosmology. Instead of having four elements as often we recognize in the West here, it's five and it is fire, earth, metal, water, and wood. And at least for me, when I think about breathing, of course, I think more of air than metals. But you didn't hear air in those five elements. And what insight can we gain by contemplating this metal or mineral element. We often, you know, have this idea of yeah, of course, metal, you need steel in big, tall buildings, or you have jewelry or precious, precious uh, minerals. But it's so, it's so absolutely essential for our body to receive all the trace minerals we need. And there's iron in our blood crystals in our ears and our eyes. Calcium in our bones. And there is a specific intimate connection to the, the, um, the element of gold with the lungs. Now start to bring yourself back to center. 
maybe moving around a little bit, <laughs> maybe just going straight into a mini Shavasana, becoming still, particularly if there's a lot of sensation in a pose, you'll find that movement actually alleviates that sensation quicker. And again, notice as you are moving or if you're reclining, how your breath is moving in you. And then hug your knees to your chest and you're gonna maybe shake side to side a little bit to massage your lower back, but then you're gonna do a spinal roll. So rolling back and forth on your spine and give yourself enough, enough momentum and maybe even spark to come into Sphinx pose. It could be a chaturanga. It could be like, hell no, not in the morning like that. <laughs> um, whatever you need to do to get into the pose of Sphinx. Now, with this connection of the mineral world, and then like on this very elemental level here on Earth, the planet is Mercury. So I like to think of, you know, you think of the, the metal Mercury. And it is... Um, mercurial. <laughs> it is wiggly and slippery and hard to contain and useful to measure. Um, you know, it's a very dynamic metal. It's not at all like you get a hunk of steel. <laughs> if you've ever in the olden days, back when I was a kid, broken a thermometer and actually see, you see the metal run away or roll away or wiggle away. I'm not sure really what it does, but it moves in this beautiful, slippery, kind of gorgeous way that we're not used to seeing things move like that. The planet is in one of the inner planets. So it is. Um, familiar to us, maybe not cognitively, but it's, it affects us quite, um, quite strongly. And again, you don't have to believe that for that to be true, which is cool. Mercury is actually, I think of Mercury also, for me, it was like a teaching planet because you know, I really understood, okay, the sun does certain things for us, helping us, you know, not only be warm and be able to see, but metaphorically leads us to this element of warmth, these heart forces and insight, as well as you see it so much in spring that the sun, like, the sun being around longer. And in Sweden, it really gets here before the warmth. The sun coaxes things to start to move in such a crazy way. And especially if you've had a week full of rain and then all of a sudden the sun comes out, you can feel that same activity in you where you just wanna go and do something. So I also think so much of the sun as um, a will instigator. The moon, we have so many wonderful stories about how the moon is connected to lunacy. And if you don't think moon affects people, either take some time to do social work, working with kids, or hang out by a jail or a police station some full moon. You might have to go there some other time during the week to compare, but the activity increases.
Now, I also remember a time when I was like, Mercury, whatever, that does not affect us. That must just be this astro astrology stuff. But I was lucky enough to find myself in a lot of um, alternative communities and new age communities. Start to lower yourself down to the yoga mat. You can wiggle and moan and groan or grunt or shake. And I remember hearing, and, and you, you always know, like probably the first couple of times I heard Mercury was retrograde, the source was not something close to me, not someone close to me. So I kept even that information more at a distance. Now stretch your left arm out to the left. We're doing a shoulder opener. We could do this one quite often, particularly because we like to gather a lot of tension in our shoulders. So you got it, Brigitte. You stretch your left arm straight out, palm face facing down, and then turn your face away from your arm and hug your knees up to your chest on your right hand side. Your knees come as high as your hips. Now this is as far as you need to go. There's already stuff happening just by putting our body in the shape. You can feel the tension on the lower shoulder calling the tension, calling attention in your body. But if you wanna go deeper, feel free to reach up with your right hand reach back and see if you can hold hands and st step onto the mat with your left foot behind your right leg. You may even be open enough to step with both of your feet on the yoga mat and eventually even both your hips are on the yoga mat. Some people need a pillow in this pose. See what you can do, where you can make adjustments to find the greatest ease in the pose here so that you can soften into it instead of just contracting and hardening and trying to wait out the sensations. So eventually it started to become a thing. Oh, Mercury retrograde. Oh yeah, better hide away. And I started to investigate it more. And what struck me was that was when I noticed experiences in my body that I connected to Mercury, especially when Mercury changes from going direct to going retrograde or vice versa. So Mercury is the planet that rules communication, transportation, and machines. You can see how close already those things are to our daily habitual life here on earth, just as we are so used to the sun rising, used to the moon changing. We also know from the name Mercury, if you've studied any of the old mythologies, is a messenger of the gods. In Norse myths, it's connected to Loki. In her, uh, Mercury, Hermes, kind of the same impulse, coyote. So what would happen and how I began to realize that I could sometimes feel this planet in my body was because I have a job where I'm speaking in, in teaching yoga, I would notice that I would have more trouble than usual, stumbling over my words, 
having a hard time finding words. There was like an awkwardness in my mouth. a jumble in communication. For me, that's where I notice it the strongest and first and where it really was, wow, this is in my body. And then roll onto your chest wiggle your fingers, let the circulation come back in. Sometimes that does not feel so pleasant. And stay present to, are you making up stories about how the next side's gonna be? I always encourage, encourage you if you notice that you're slipping into making up stories, make good ones. So the next side's gonna be awesome. It's gonna feel so good. All right, so stretch your right arm out to the right, palm facing down. Turn your gaze away from your hand, from your right, and then hug your knees up to your chest on the left-hand side. You're doing it right, Brigitte. <laughs> You're great. And go as far as your body wants you to go today. So there's no, there's nothing gained by holding hands, really. I mean, yes, you get a certain openness in your shoulder and that allows you to kind of relax with the grip. I mean, it's not usually our go-to relax position, but it allows you to release a little bit. You want to find enough ease in this uncomfortable posture to stay present. When, when one starts to study something, and it doesn't matter if it's, um, if you're studying, you know, uh, like if you're studying medicine, or if you're studying um, engineering, or history, or really doesn't matter what you are studying. But this phenomena of putting your attention and, and gaining information and then this integration of the information into your being and your body, you will see that whatever you are studying, you find and see and pay attention more into your, in your outer world. So this sensation of feeling mercury go retrograde in my mouth, it is a small planet, but not that small was really about like, it made it kind of like, ooh, I got to pay attention. And so I started looking more deeply into the nature of Mercury. It's a small, dense planet. It's closest to the sun, but it's actually not the hottest planet, which I think is kind of cool. It defies what we think should happen, just like when you break a thermometer and the mercury runs around the room. But more I studied and through observation and started to notice how many miscommunications happened, especially in that potent times of transition. Now roll back onto your belly, moan and groan, wiggle your fingers.
just pause for a moment either with movement and shaking or just in stillness. Again, allow your breath to be your barometer, letting you know how you're doing. So this phenomena of retrograde of a planet is merely a phenomena of perspective. And one so useful for us to remember. Now we're gonna go into seal or sphinx. And as, especially as a vinyasa junkie, I'm pointing at myself, like power yoga, <laughs> hooked on power yoga, you know, we're so, we're so captivated by dynamicism and change and this entertainment of doing new things. Um, and so I, I love inviting you to do either seal or do Sphinx again. And instead of to be like, oh my gosh, I mean, it wasn't even like 10 minutes ago, we just did this pose. Instead, see if you can actually be open to coming to it in a new way. So our perspective on earth is why Mercury goes retrograde for us in our little universe. Nothing has changed in the planet Mercury itself. It goes on its orbit like every other celestial body. It moves in one direction at a constant speed with a clear kind of path around the sun. So the change isn't in Mercury, nothing changed. I mean, everything changes with Mercury, but nothing has changed with the movements of the planet. The only thing that has changed is our relationship to it. And so you will see more miscommunications, more emails going to the wrong place, text messages not being sent, computers crashing, cars breaking down, cars crashing, people falling and hurting themselves more, um, things breaking more. And, and I love it if you, like, I don't want you to take my word for you. I want you to notice it because it's not, it's not like a, oh, I learned this from my teacher kind of situation. It doesn't, it, that's not so interesting. But when you start to realize and notice like, wow, that actually happens then it becomes something that can teach us in a way that's very different than just an intellectual education. And what it leads me to in my own experience, this phenomena of being able to feel mercury in my mouth is it makes me re-examine the holiness, the genius, the divinity of my own vehicle. Like the fact that I have this sensitivity, that you have it too, I'm sure. Just as we are sensitive to the sun, as we are sensitive to the moon. This planet, I don't have the numbers in front of me, I don't think, but it's not, it's not like close by. Just as the sun and the moon aren't close enough to touch and yet they affect me so deeply. In the lungs and the large intestine organ pair, the health of the lungs is something that can change in an instant. The lungs connect us to this preciousness, the ephemeral quality of life, the impermanence.
And when our lungs and large intestines are way out of balance, or not way, just out of balance, or the meridians connected to them are doing poorly with too much or too little energy, what it amplifies in our experience is despair. And specifically, the despair of loss. Take five more full, deep, unhurried breaths. And then after your fifth breath, release down to the ground. As we know our systems to be dynamic, meaning that if I change one thing, everything changes. If I adjust one thing, everything feels it. So when we also have times in our life where we mourn the loss of something and find ourselves embedded in that loss and despair, it also will work negatively back towards the lungs and the large intestines. Now come up onto your knees so that you line up your hips over your knees and we're moving into Anahata Asana. So this is the, the pose of the heart and it's like um, sometimes referred to as puppy dog. So with your hips stacked over your knees, you stretch your arms forward, just like we do in child's pose. And if it's uncomfortable for you, you can, it's a little like doing a dab in child's pose. Okay, audiences where you can bring your forearm underneath your forehead to let your body be more comfortable there. You can also use a pillow or nothing. So you can do it like that. Yeah. So you want to let your hips stay over your knees. You're not reaching your hips back to your heels. Yeah, you got it. Um, it's not a very... Um, comfortable pose because we feel a little bit like an ostrich with the head stuck in the sand kind of thing. When our lungs and large intestines are healthy and balanced, What they support in our capacity is a capacity to be reverential, to have reverence for something or everything. We can translate this to really recognizing the beingness and worthiness of everything. So we can have this experience of reverence as if, as if it's happening to us when we see incredibly beautiful things, whether it's a sunset, a cathedral, or the face of someone you love. And even when we start to just think about for a moment, one of those things, one of those examples. You can feel in your body this, ah. This experience of reverence has become less common. We are in, inundated 
with images and beauty all the time. And when we hurry about and race through our lives, we become too busy to spend the time or attention to notice just how incredible so much of this world is. This reverence for me is also, it's very intimately connected to how we, what we believe in. So for a long time, I, well, it's not the right way to start that sentence. Since high school, maybe even earlier, I have both been equally fascinated and interested in science and health and, and the workings of the human body as I have been in art. And I've worked in serious places. <laughs> By serious, I mean like, you know, I've had real jobs like writing a software manual or, you know, being in sales or mm -hmm, all sorts of things. And continually, and being then also part of um, alternative educations, working on my own, offering both yoga and art. And inevitably, again and again, we dismiss beauty and like art and art, the need to make art and beauty as not as important, as secondary to the real work. Let your hips sink down, squeeze your knees together and take your arms behind you coming into embryo pose. In educations that are focused on how to meet the future and alternative educations, especially, or um, beautiful kind of regenerative work or systems thinking, they too err, just like public schools do, on dismissing the arts, believing them secondary to our experience in life. And then roll up, cross your ankles, roll over your crossed ankles and turn sideways on your yoga mat. We're going into lateral dragonfly. And so you're gonna stretch your legs out. Now you might need to elevate your hips so that you're not sitting behind yourself, but you're lined up so your pelvis tilts and you can sit upright here. You're gonna turn your gaze to the right. And then with your left arm, you're gonna feel your left arm reach down your left leg. You can also put a pillow here if you know you're gonna need it. And you might be able to bend your elbow and hold your head. If you're bendy and open, you might put your elbow on the floor. You, if you have a bolster handy, you can put the bolster on your leg and the elbow on the bolster, and then you can relax into it. And then you're going to stretch your right arm up to the sky and then reach blindly still for your left foot. So you can't see your left foot, but you might be able to hold it. And you might not. 
Now, if it's, if it becomes too extreme with your arm reaching, you're always welcome to take your arm behind your back again. You can also kind of drape your arm over your head. Like a, yeah. Hmm? Like a little head scarf. I hope you've all seen that quite little silly meme that says without art, earth just becomes eh. Have you seen that? Anyways. I think particularly like I kind of, yeah, I, I think our education systems have so much room for growth and I feel every year more and more and more lucky that I got to be, um, that I got to go through all 12 years of Walder school or 13 years. And um, the, the way that you, children are taught there is so holistic. So the art goes together with the science that goes together with the history. And as we know, and we're, we're learning every day more and more, collectively, these things belong together. But this impulse of this kind of dismissal of arts has also been coupled together with um, a loss of religions. But it's not so much the religion religious institutes, it's the content of the spirituality that they were connected to. And so for so many beautifully free human beings, they've rejected not only the church and the institution of the church or the synagogue or the temple, but kind of want to throw away every, everything that was connected to it. the term of like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And we've let our capacity for reverence be unattended. What's possible with the breakdown of these institutions is actually an amazing kind of freedom to be yourself even in your worship. With your exhale, you're going to turn towards your left leg and actually just bow down towards your left leg, twisting into coming over your leg for a couple of moments. Yes. There's this wonderful, I'm not going to give you the whole history lesson, but if you, um, because I've studied Christianity, if you look at how, you know, the first churches were um, initiated and kind of this codification of Christianity that happened, and then um, how there was this great schism, and then there was another schism, and then what happened when, when Christianity went to the United States, actually, it, it, it like shattered, not in a broken way, but in like a like the way that a prism breaks up a beam of light and shines rainbows all over the place. There was this, this uh, impulse and drive that here it was, the land of liberty and freedom, how, how far we've come, um, that one of, one of this Christian historian, he actually writes that this was well on the way to every man having his own church. 
and you see it like like there's so many variations of the Baptists and the Pentecostals and like weird like churches out in the middle of the woods and tents doing strange things and calling it odd things or you know big mega church. I mean, there's so many variations of of worship, and we've come to this this next step, so to say that internationally across the world these institutions are breaking down and falling apart and um it's it's really our individual task to take up this responsibility of ritual and worship of reverence So in these times where we're left, we're left so insanely free to believe in what is true in our heart. A lot of, I won't even tell you, but rise up, come back to center. I'm not gonna start that sentence before we go to the other side. Wiggle and jiggle and maybe do a little dance or just a little shake, whatever you need. And then you continue to look at your beautiful left leg, even though you were just there. You reach with your right arm, down your right leg. And then maybe you have a bolster or pillow, bend your elbow, hold onto your head, and then reach over and see if you can touch your right toes with your left hand. But this idea of we are so confoundingly free to believe in whatever we want to believe, because um, one there's probably a Facebook group. Blah, blah, there's probably a Facebook group for whatever it is you want to believe in. Um, you know, you do research on the internet, and at least before censorship and stuff, you can usually find anything. And uh, literally, there's like there's just such a proliferation of belief and, and different individualities and different interpretations that if we have this idea and we start to concentrate and study it, we actually find that we recognize it everywhere and see it in different places and find it. Unfortunately, we have this, this new institution that has kind of replaced these big churches or big temples even, or synagogues where we have this invisible church of science. And it's wonderful from Charles Eisenstein. I, he shows this great kind of, he has a nice talk about, you know, they even, they even have, instead of having the alb, the, the, you know, the priest's clothing, you know, have the surgeon's clothing, clothing, and they even put on a mask to like, let their identity be quiet so they can be there in service of science. And they, they go through this ritualized washing of their hands and they take out their ritualized instruments and you know it's it's a wonderful picture that we can see and just like happened in the catholic church for instance this incredible amount of power and money that has started to pervert and and cloud the the holiness of the initial mission this is also where we are with science there's even there's even surgeries that don't work as well as they used to because people don't trust them anymore. But what I'm trying to get at and my ultimate goal about following this line of investigation was that when we actively practice being reverential, 
taking the time to appreciate beauty, exploring what gives us a sense of awe or faith or love or trust. We start to recognize the beingness of the whole earth and the beingness of everything. And we land back at this incredible, you know, divine vehicle we've been given to for these pursuits. And so the fact that I can feel the celestial body of Mercury in my mouth wakes me up to how holy our instrument is. Turn yourself to your right leg and bow down, giving thanks maybe for your beautiful right leg. Go so nicely with your left one. So instead of trying to bolster up the safety of, you know, not believing in the invisible and just thinking that the worthwhile things are materialistic things, it becomes a ritual act. It becomes an act of love even to honor and notice beauty. You know, it's just in, in Japanese symbology, it's the cherry blossom that symbolizes the ephemeral nature of life. This blossom that blooms and it's gorgeous and the smell and you have just this complete proliferation of beauty all around and then it's gone. So with reverence, with this creating your own temple or church, your participation is key. And inhale up, squeeze your knees in. Huh? Give yourself a hug, drop your head down, close your eyes. And then lie down and come into Shavasana, the little, little, little brother of death. <laughs> Palms open, legs as wide as is comfortable for you. Feel free to cover yourself. Let your eyes be closed and trusting. Let your body be, be still, your palms open to receive. Allow your attention to stay present. And one tool you can use to do that is your capacity to listen.
With your next inhale, invite your breath to the edges of your body. Feel how it carries awareness on it. Wiggle your fingers and your toes. Maybe smile a bunch. Stretch your arms long over your head, reach your body long, and then with your exhale, roll into a ball and onto your side. And then help yourself up into a comfortable seated position. Allow your hands to meet at heart center. Lift your heart up towards your thumbs. Let your elbows be heavy. Close your eyes and just notice we weren't alone in the moment, even if we're alone in the room. Empty your breath all the way. Take a deep inhale. Ah. Bring your prayer hands to your third eye. Invite the divine light. And as we bow forward together, we say, Namaste. Namaste. And so much love. Oh, woo. Yeah. Well done. I hope this practice lands in your body. Have a great weekend. See you soon, I hope. You too. Hello. Au revoir. Ciao.